Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Praise God. Praise the Lord, everybody. Thank you for letting me be with you today. And uh, my goodness, I, I go to a lot of places. I see a lot of faces. And uh, your praise group has got my Geritol bubbling. <laughs> wow. I mean, that one guy was running around here before I told the bishop. I said, man, that guy's going to be out of gas by the time this thing's over. <laughs> wow. And uh, it's, it's so enjoyable to be with you. I have been shut down for almost a year because of the coronavirus thing, and now we're kind of back on the road and traveling every place and doing whatever we can, and I'm very happy to be with you. I have, uh, I have four hours of a sermon to preach. I got I to gotta do it in about 35 or 40 minutes, and uh, so I would like to help you if I could, okay? I, my my um, mantra has been for the last 20 years in Pentecost, you need to be able to go to heaven from your last church service. And if, if you're not excited about the one you're in, forget about going to the next one. I, I, I heard a, a statement made by a, a preacher, and he said, if you don't plan on doing any more with the time God has given you now, why would God be foolish enough to give you some more time? All right. I got a plane to catch, so you're safe. I'm reading from, from 1 Samuel, okay, chapter 30. If you want to turn there with me, I'll do my best to take care of this here. Uh, verse 1, it came to pass when David and his men were... Come to Ziglag on, on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag, smitten Ziglag and burned it to, with fire, had taken the women captives, and they therein slew not any, neither, neither great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. And so David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and sons and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people with them lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken. I, now, you got to get this because to us, names are nothing. Jeffrey, Bill, Mary, Kathy, it's nothing. It's just a name. But in Bible times, when they name people names, they had specific meanings to them. And he said, so his two wives were taken, a hinnom, and Abigail. Now, you can read right by that and say, big deal, Ahinam and Abigail. But there is a tremendous revelation in there. The two women that they took, here's what their names meant. Abigail's name meant joy. Ahinam's name meant grace. The adversary, if he can steal your grace, you'll lose your joy. Okay, he said, he don't need your money. He, he, he wants your emotions. He wants your faith. He, he, he wants to mess with you, okay? Well, that went, that went over like a lead balloon. Let, let me, okay? So he says, and uh, David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him. See, the Bible is a very present story. When the leader or the preacher does well, God gets the credit. When all hell breaks loose and you're in trouble... Let's kill the preacher. And that's what they did. They lost their kids, their family, everything. And what did they do? They attacked David. Duh. It's so crazy. Now watch, this is so powerful. I, I know what I'm doing, please. I just look stupid. I'm not stupid. I just look stupid. So they, they said it's spawning him because the peoples were grieved, everyone for his sons and his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the... Lord, and, and, and David went to Abathah, the priest, the Hilophel's son, and he said, Pray, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathah brought thither the ephod. This is so powerful. And David incur, inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop, and shall I overtake them? Now, that's funny. David asked two questions. God gave three answers. 
Because God will always give you more than you ask for. He said, shall I pursue, will I overtake? Now watch what God says. Okay, pursue, you shall overtake. And then he adds his, his little sweetness. And without fail, recover all. That's powerful. So when you read the rest of the story, when you get down to, to, to verse 18, it says, And David recovered all and rescued his two wives. I want to preach to you for a little bit tonight. I was going to preach this at General Conference, but they didn't ask me. I was going to preach it because of the times, but it's been canceled. I was going to preach it at North Carolina camp meeting, but they didn't ask me. So I'll just preach it here. Okay? Here. Here's what, I, here's what I want to talk to you about. Experiencing what God wants you to. Experiencing what God wants you to. Lord, bless the preaching. Help me to be a blessing. Let the gifts of the Spirit operate, heal, save, and deliver, and set free. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. Most of you are asking questions right now. Well, what, what exactly does God want me to experience? Well, now that you've asked me, I will tell you. You ready? Yeah. Recovery. Right. Yeah. No, no, no. I appreciate you five Baptists that just clapped your hands. <laughs> Let me try it again. Recovery. Yeah. For those of you that are not excited about the Bible, I will, I will read to you the interpretation of Mr. Webster. Now, he doesn't preach for us, and he doesn't have a license, but he wrote a neat book with lots of stories and words in it. And I looked it up in the dictionary. It says, recovery, to get back something that has been lost or stolen, whether it be property, self, self-position, whether it be joy, faith, a return to health, a regaining of something that has been taken away, whether it's control or composure, to regain or retrieve or to get back something that has been lost. If if you can understand this, when you read the Bible, 66 books in the Bible, from the first page to the last page, it is a record of recovery. The entire Bible is a story of recovery. For way back when Adam first sinned, he recovered. He could have died, but the Lord killed an animal and spared his life and covered him with the coats, and he recovered from that. And from there all the way through, and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, the the Bible is a book of recovery. Why? And I felt like the Holy Ghost said to me, he said, because I'm the author and I'm the Lord of recovery. No, well, let me help you. you. You people doing your little Mount Rushmore impersonation, it's really impressive. And you super glued to your seats, you're really impressed. Do you realize you wouldn't be in the church if you hadn't recovered? You wouldn't have any joy if God hadn't let you experience recovery. If it had not been for the Lord who is on our side, we'd be lost forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you, you sit down. So sometimes you just need to turn around and say, I, I, I need to get back what I've lost. You know, some, sometimes you and I can still be saved, but lost our joy. We lost our faith. We lost our expectations. I don't know whether I told you this, but I, I say it all over Pentecost. Expectation is the birthplace for the miraculous. You're not going to experience a miracle if you don't expect it. Well, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to preach until I resurrect the dead. Now, 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 now stay, just stay, stay with me just for a minute. This is, this is powerful. I'm giving you stuff there. They won't teach this to you in Bible school because they don't know it, and I don't teach there. They're very foolish. They need to let me teach there. I just look stupid. I'm not stupid. 
Now you got to get this. I'm going to make a statement going to kind of fry your North Carolina minds right now. But you'll be okay. Listen to me. The promises of God are not enough. Now just stay with me. You don't, you don't have to fake it. Eh, it's a. No, you don't do that. So, you ready? When God gives you a promise, promises from God are not self-fulfilling. When God gives you a promise, it is a revelation of divine intention. What he plans on doing, and then he steps back to see whether the promise will inspire you to act. Remember, James said, faith without works is dead. And belief without behavior is a disease. Say, sit around and say, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. That'll get you as far as from here to the bus station. I believe in Jesus. Well, wh what are you doing about what you believe? Yeah, it's, 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 I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to be Jeffrey, okay? You understand? I told you, promises are not self-fulfilling. They're revelations. Israel was pregnant with the promises of God. God had promised them the promised land. He told them, I give you the title deed to Canaan. It's yours. It's a done deal. You're ready. But they would not act on the promise, and they died outside the promised land. So we can walk around all day long. I've got a promise. I've got a promise. They had a promise, and they died holding the promise in their hand outside the promised land. Yeah, yeah. Very, very fortunate for you. I can't half see you people. Wait a minute. What is this? More wires. My God, you get electrocuted up here. It's a trap. <laughs> okay? Sit, sit, sit down just a second. There, there, there's something else I want to tell you. This is so powerful. David, this is mind-boggling to me. One of the greatest revelations God ever gave me. If you read two chapters previous, David has run away out of Canaan and is now in Philistine country. He's living in Ziglag because he's tired of being chased by King Saul. That happens to all of us. We get tired of problems. We get tired of situations. We get tired of, of unfulfilled prayers, unfulfilled expectations. We get so frustrated. But you got to be careful. When you're frustrated, don't make a major decision. Just stay with what you know is true. But David, now you got to get me because this is, this is the Bible. David made a decision. I'm going out of Canaan and I'm going into the Philistines' land and Saul will get tired of chasing me. And Saul did. Once Saul found out he was in the land of the Philistines, David experienced a temporary relief. When you walk away from the things of God, you may experience a temporary relief, but it's only temporary. All hell is fixing to break loose in just a little while. Now, now I got some, uh, oh, there's my redhead, my redhead, I love that dress, that's so pretty. Are you ready? This is so powerful. The scripture says that David was in Ziglag two chapters before. He was in Ziglag one year and four months. Now, last time, mathematically, that's 16 months. One year and four months. This is powerful. There are 150 Psalms. 150. In all the 150 psalms, David never wrote one psalm, one song, or one prayer was ever recorded while he was in Ziglag. Not once. And I asked the Lord, I said, how come he didn't write any psalms? I felt the Lord said to me, because my people, when they live in fear and disobedience, the music stops. The joy stops. The music stops. Sixteen months. There's not one record that David ever made a prayer. Not one time. Sixteen months. He's, he's like half backslid. You see, he lost more than his wives and his daughters. He lost his peace. He lost his faith. He lost his jive. He became self-confident instead of God-trusting. That happens to all of us sometimes or another. We walk away from the stuff we know we shouldn't walk away from, and then we wonder, where's our joy? Where's our faith? Where's our expectation? 
This, this is so powerful to me. This is so powerful. Now, they talk about killing him. They're going to stone him because they're all upset. And David, the Bible says, encouraged himself in the Lord and calls for Abathah, the priest, and says, come here, bring me the ephod. This is mind-boggling. This ought to encourage you. You folks that are super glued to your seat, now's your chance to come out. Are you, are you ready? Here's what. Here's what he says, bring me the ephod. And he turns to us, and David inquired in the Lord. Now, now, now Pastor, I don't want to be rude, but, but this is mind-boggling to me. That is either the greatest act of gall or the greatest act of grace. He has not talked to God for 16 months. He said, shall I pursue? Will I overtake? The next verse says, pursue. No debate, no probation. No insult, no he, God is ready to answer. God is ready to deliver. God is ready to give you what you have lost. Woo. Woo. Hallelujah. Woo. Maybe you sit down. Maybe sit down. That doesn't do for you what it does for me. There's been times when I have fallen short, when I have disobeyed, when I've acted stupid, and I've been wrong, had bad thoughts, said things I shouldn't have said, and I went to prayer, and I found God was ready. It's ready. If you read Isaiah 38, the Bible said that Isaiah the prophet came into Hezekiah and said, Set your house in order, for thou shalt not live, thou shalt die. Now, when you get an edict from the mouth of God, it's over, baby. Yeah. You, you can turn in TBN or anything you want. It's over. God says, you're fixing to kick the bucket. Well, the Bible says Isaiah walks out. Hezekiah turns his face to the wall and starts crying and boo-hooing and saying, I've tried to live for you and I've done good and I've had revival and I've tried to restore godliness. Lord, don't bump me off. Don't kill me, please. And before Isaiah's off the porch, God said, hey, Isaiah, go back and tell him. I've seen his tears and I've heard his prayer and I'll add to him 15 years. Now, now, this is powerful. This is, I don't mean to be offensive, but this is powerful. When the prophet told him a negative report, thou shalt die, he accepted it. When the prophet came back in and said, God's going to give you 15 years, he said, I need a sign. Let me go over here to the cheap seats. Let me go over here. You, you understand that? When God says, I'm going to kill you, I believe that. When God says, I'm going to heal you, I don't believe that. He said, what shall be the sign? This is so powerful. God is so merciful. He says, you need a sign? I'll tell you what I'll do. To convince you that I'm telling you the truth, I'll reverse the solar system. And the Bible said, he, whoo, he made the shadow go back so many degrees. He literally reversed the entire. You got a God that can move anything to help you. He knows that sometimes our faith is weak and our faith is shallow, but he's willing to give you a sign. Shall I move the shadow forward? Shall I move the shadow backwards? Well, if going forward is normal. Give me something that's abnormal. So he just stopped the rotation of the sun and turned around and made it go back the other way. I wonder how many times in my life and your life, God has done miraculous things and we didn't even know it. Uh, uh, are you staying with me yet? She said, I'm, I'm, I'm going as fast as I can. I got all this stuff I got to preach. This is so powerful. I am, please forgive me. I need therapy. I'm not the standard UPC guy. I need therapy. I'm whacked, okay? But, 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 but the only thing I give as a grounds for my apology is I'm a recovering sinner. I'm a recovering drunk. I'm a recovering whoremonger. I'm a recovering jailbird. I'm a recovering liar. I wish I had some people in this house that have experienced some type of recovery. 
If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, there ain't no telling where I'd be right now. I don't mean to be rude. I'm here as your guest. But let me tell you something. I travel for a living. I'm all over this nation. Listen to me. I see all kinds. Your congregation is hyper. Man, my, my, my geritol. I mean, it's, it's amazing. But I preach all over this nation. And you can't believe how many people are supposed to be baptized in Jesus' name, have the Holy Ghost, and they're as happy as a bucket of mud. I tell people all the time, if you got the Holy Ghost, why don't you tell your face? It's the joy of the Lord that keeps me going. You don't know like I know what he's done for me. Hey, you don't know like I know how he set me free. He brought me out of bondage into his marvelous light. I got to praise God. I got to sing. I got to clap. Has nothing to do with emotion. Has everything to do with I'm recovered. Sit down. Sit down. I'm going as fast as I can. Recovery should not be strange to us. We recovered from wars. We recovered from tsunami, hurricanes, earthquakes. We, now we're in the process with the COVID. We're trying to recover from this world epidemic. Recovery is normal. By the way, last time I checked, hospitals are so crazy, they even, they even earmark a room called recovery room. Now, how can a hospital have a recovery room and a church not have one? You know what I think? I think the church, the body of Christ, it's God's recovery room for people whose lives have been messed up, for people who have gone through troubles and setbacks. Now, maybe that's, that's the reason why we have different levels of spirituality in the church, because some people recover faster than others. I, am I making sense? I'm going back to the chiefs. I got to watch it over. He's trying to kill me. Just, you, you understand me? Listen to me. I'm going to make a statement. This is powerful. This is powerful. You ready? When he said, shall I pursue? Will I overtake? The Lord said, pursue. God gave this to me. I didn't steal it from nobody. I didn't take it from the internet. I'm the only guy in UPC. I don't even own a computer. I don't own a computer. I don't own an iPhone. I don't own an iPad. That stuff bothers me. Everything starts with I. I don't even like that company called Apple because they got a bite on the side of that. That tells me that's coming from Eve's problem. Okay? And so you can have your computers and play with your Antichrist toys. Do all you want to. That's, that's your business. But, but God gave this to me. He said, tell my people, you can never possess what you're unwilling to pursue. We can sit on our backside all day long, hear sermons, read Bible. But if we don't go after what we've lost, if we don't reach for what God promised us to get back, you can't get it back. Remember I told you, the promises of God are not enough. They're just revelation of intention designed to inspire us. Watch this. David said, without fail, thou shalt, God said to David, thou shalt without fail recover all. You ready? He's got a divine promise. If you read the rest of the chapter, he had to fight from twilight to the next twilight to get back what he lost. So when you get a promise from God, you've got to understand you're going to have to fight to get it. You're going to have to contend with the adversary to get it. It's yours by divine edict, but you have to pursue it. Uh, 
Am I making sense yet? Okay, I, I can't see. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Watch this. And you will never pursue until you're persuaded it's available. This is, this is so powerful. I, I'm sorry I'm, I'm taking so long with this, but, uh, you know, I, I'm worse than any drug addict. Now, I never did drugs. I was a drunk and a hellraiser and a pool shooter and a gambler and a honky-tonker, but I didn't do no drugs, okay? But we have a lot of ex-drug people and drug pushers in our church, and, and I noticed that when, when druggies do something, now you probably don't understand this because you're all chaste. You all come out of your mother's womb talking in tongues. You don't have any idea what I'm talking But But drug addicts, when, when they want to get high, they do what's called, they do a line. They, they lay this stuff out. It looks like sweet and low, but it's sweet and high. And they, and they put a line down and they take a little straw and they go... And they escape from reality. Well, I don't do drugs. I don't do coke. I don't do marijuana. I don't do any of that stuff. But there are times when I'm discouraged and I'm down and out. But what I do is I don't get on the Internet to talk to people because I don't even know how to do it. Here's what I do. I do a line. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. If God be for me, who can be against me? No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me and gave himself to me. Sit, sit, sit. sit down. I'm, I'm going as fast as I can. The, this is so powerful. If you read Genesis, I don't have time to hit all this. When you read Genesis, it said they attacked Sodom and Gomorrah. They captured Lot, his wife, and all his kids and all his goods. And Abraham armed his, his people and his servants in his house. And he went after these kings. And the Bible said, and he got back all the goods plus Lot, his wife, and his children. Because God is a God of recovery. And it doesn't matter how bad it looks. doesn't matter how dismal it looks. You remember the guy who was chopping the wood in 2 Kings and the axe hell fell in the water? And he turned around and he said, Alas, my master, for it was borrowed. He said, Well, tell me where you lost it. There's the key. Every one of us really know where we lost it. But we're not willing to admit it. And you can't quit until you admit you can't possess until you confess. In order to experience a miracle required honesty and humility. Here's where I lost it. And he showed Elisha the prophet right here. Now watch. When you get ready to get something back and recover, your adversary is going to show you how impossible the situation is. How improbable the situation is. Why? Because that... that that axe head had went all the way into the bottom of the Jordan. And the Jordan was pure muddy river. They couldn't see nothing. And Elisha, just a symbolic thing. He takes a piece of wood and sticks it in the water. That's a picture of Calvary's cross. Put the cross in the water and you can get back what you've lost. And the Bible says, and the axe did swim. If a, if a piece of iron can experience a resurrection, people can experience a resurrection. I, 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 I'm, I don't know whether I'm doing good or not. I can't tell. Somebody needs to yell at me right now. I want my stuff back. I want my stuff. Tell the devil, I want my stuff back. I want my children coming back. I want my joy back. I want my expectation back. I want my faith back. Sit down, sit down. I got, I, I appreciate you folks. You're so easy to preach to. And, and I keep going over here because these people are whacked. These people are whacked over here. You super glued people scare me. <laughs> oh, 
I do want to upset you right now. I do. Ready? It ought to be dangerous sitting next to a Pentecostal. You sit down next to somebody that's experienced a recovery in their life and wanting another, they'll probably knock you in the head. They'll probably knock your wig off. They'll probably dance on your blue suede shoes. Now, the people that I see across this movement that don't worship very much and don't get excited, I am convinced they've not recovered anything. People, people have their recovery from divorce, have their recovery from bankruptcy, have their recovery from broken health. Why do you think we go through surgeries, even experimental surgeries? Why do we take medicines and what have you? Because we're wanting to recover. That recovery is a part of our life. But it's like the Lord spoke to me and said, I am in charge of the greatest recovery. For I can get people to recover from sin. And I can get people to recover from sickness. And I can get people to recover from depression. And I can get people to recover from discouragement. And, and I can get... Ah, I can help people recover when they think they have no faith. Yeah. Can, I, can I preach a few? I don't know where are you. Can I preach a few? Watch this. This is so powerful. I, now those of you that are, hadn't said anything yet, here's your chance. They go after them. He says, without fail, thou shalt recover all. So he arms his troops, and he takes off after these guys. If you read the rest of the chapter, I don't have time for it. The Bible said they find this guy wandering, and they bring him to him. He says, who are you? He said, I'm a young man of Egypt, and I am a servant of Amalekite. This is powerful. This is so powerful. And he said, he had not eaten or drank water for three days and three nights. So he's exhausted walking in the wilderness and been on a three-day fast. The Bible says that David gave him water, gave him a piece of cake, and then gave him a, a clump of figs that he could eat, okay? And his spirit came again. Now, this is so powerful. This don't turn your motor on. You need more than STP. You need a major overhaul. You ready? He says, uh, what are you doing out here? Watch what he says. He said, three days ago, I fell sick. Ready? Here it is. If this don't help you, baby, you can't be helped. <laughs> Ready for this? And my master left me. And it's like the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, tell my people, I will never leave them. I will never forsake them. I will never turn my back on them. I don't care how bad the situation is. I don't care how many times they promised and they failed. I don't care how many times they've suffered from things. Tell my people, when they fall, when they get sick, when they sin, when they mess up, I will never, ever turn my back on them and walk away from them. We are God's people forever. Now, now, maybe that doesn't do for you what it does for me. But since I've been saved, I said things I wish I hadn't. I've, I've done things I wish I hadn't. I have felt things I wish I hadn't. But I went to pray. God said, yes. No, 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 no. Sit, sit, down, sit down, sit down, sit down. I'm not trying to turn this into a carnival. I'm trying to help you with this. this is, now, your homework assignment, you go read Isaiah 38. You read Isaiah 38. That's when Hezekiah is sick. And he turns around, and the Lord said, I'm going to hear you. The Bible said, Isaiah the prophet comes to Hezekiah, and he says, Lay a lump of figs on the boil, and thou shalt recover. Fine. Now, he's, he's got a promise, but he's got to do something. Yeah. I believe in Jesus. No, no, no. You've got to do something. You've got to act on the promise. Now, here's what's amazing. This, this, this is so powerful. Hezekiah, we read Isaiah 38. Hezekiah says, This is, <laughs> I wish I was young enough. I'd like to run. <laughs> I can't jump off here. You need a parachute. <laughs> you ready? Watch what he says. He said, So I went to pray. Here it is. And the Lord was ready to save me. 
Now, I want to ask you something. The last time you failed, the last time you were picking low cotton, the last time you messed up, the last time you shot yourself in the foot spiritually, when you went to ask God, was he reluctant or was he ready? I think we serve a God that's on his tiptoes right now. That's saying, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and you shall be opened. God is ready right now to heal, to forgive, to encourage, to deliver, to save. I'm trying to, I don't mean I love you folks less, but this, this electrocution stuff is scaring me over here. And I got to stay over here. Sit down just a minute. I got something else you got to read. So you got a homework assignment. You got to read Isaiah 38, take you five minutes, and you read the rest of the song of, of 1 Samuel 30. That's all it is. But the Bible says that when he brought the guy down, he said, can you take me to the people that stole my wives and kids and burned my city down? Yeah, if you don't deliver me to my master. I said, yeah, I will. If you read it, he says, they go down, and when they came over the hill, the Philistines, watch this, were dancing. I wish I could do the moonwalk. Um, said, they were dancing. They were throwing down. They were doing the cha-cha. They were doing the mashed potatoes. They they were, they were having a party. They were, read it, it says, and they were laughing, and they were singing, and they were partying, and they were dancing. And it's like the Holy Ghost said to me, tell my people, when your adversary steals something from you, he throws a party over it. That's why when the prodigal son recovered, came back, the father threw a party for him. And when you reach to recover something, you're going to cause God so much joy. He's going, to th He's going to throw a party over you recovering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can, can I preach a few more minutes? Where are you? Preach a few more Sit, sit down just a second. I want to read you a scripture that's the most mind-boggling scripture. It's over in 2 Kings 5. The Bible said, Naaman was a mighty man with his master. He was a great man. He, that's what it says. He called him great. Even though he was lost, he was great. And he was, uh, he was in charge. He was the general, the host of the Syrian army. But he was a leper. Yeah. Okay, now watch. This is mind-boggling. You can help me with this. You're smart. You can help me with this, okay? You can tell me on the way to the airport what this means. But it's mind-boggling because I ain't figured this out yet. The Bible says, and they had a little maid who was a POW, a prisoner of war. She was stolen from her mom and dad. She was stolen from her home. She was taken as a slave and a captive into the land. And she became the maid to Naaman's wife. She was a slave. Now, this is what blows my mind. Though she was a slave, though God allowed terrible things to happen in his life, she never became bitter. She wasn't sour. She wasn't rude. She wasn't, well, I wish to God you'd kill that jerk. I wish you'd give his wife AIDS. I wish you'd kill these suckers. <coughs> See, the greatest thing you can have is a good attitude. And, and she, she's got a great attitude, even though she was a POW. And she was a slave. And God, I wish I had time. Can, can God trust you with trouble, you little wussy? Does, does, the, does the wind always have to blow at your neck and rather your face? Are you always walking downhill instead of uphill? I think many of us, we love God, but we lack trials to make us what we ought to be because God can't trust us with trouble. The minute you get a little trouble, you leave. You throw the towel and you quit. So, so God trusted this little maid with terrible trouble. She's a prisoner. She's a captive. Now, now, now Pastor, listen to me. This is mind-boggling. I've never read it in a book. I, I got you. I don't play on the internet. I could care less about all that trash. I'm, I'm not against it. I just don't care about it. That's your business. You, you play all you want to. That's fine. I don't care flip about it. I don't care about anybody knowing I'm in the bathtub. I could care less that my friends, I, I'm out in the, cutting the lawn. What are you doing? Oh, I'm here playing with my bird. The bird, give me a break. <laughs> I came here from Atlanta. I came into Atlanta. And I, 
90% of the people in Atlanta on the concourse were doing this. And I want to say, uh, they just shot your mother. Uh, they killed your father. They kidnapped your two kids. We're raising a generation where people don't count. People would rather deal with people on the internet than face to face. Because the inner. Now watch this. This is powerful. I, I'm, am I doing good? Am I doing good? I, I can't tell. I, I'm not used to preaching to the living dead. Okay. Watch this. This little maid. Ready, Pastor? This is your chance to get on your feet. Ready? Watch. Watch what he said. She said, Would to God my master was with the prophet in Samaria. Watch this. For he would recover him. She had no ill will towards Naaman. No ill will towards... The, don't have ill will towards people that hurt you. You can save them. You can be used by God to help them and encourage them. Don't have a wrong attitude because people mistreat you. Okay, sit down. Here, here, here. Okay, sit down. I'm asking the pastor. I got his attention. I can see you. Here's what I want to know. Oh, great theological guru. Here's what I want to know. Where did she get that kind of faith? According to the Bible, not one person previous to that chapter in the entire Old Testament, not one person is recorded as ever being healed of leprosy. Not one person. Not one person. When Jesus was talking in the New Testament, he said, many lepers were in Israel in the days of Elisha the prophet, but only Naaman was healed. Many widows were in the land with Elisha. Only one widow was the prophet sent to. He turned around like he slapped the Jews in the face. He said, nobody in the Old Testament was ever healed of leprosy. I want to know where the lady got that faith because she had no precedent to lean on. Now here, here's what bugs me. You ready? She had nothing to lean on. That's not us. We got records of people being healed. We got records of people being delivered. We have many testimonies of people being healed and delivered and set free. It ought to be easy for us to believe that God can recover somebody. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going, to, I'm going as fast as I can. Uh, uh, what, what's the scripture I gave to you, Flash? Uh, excuse me, I shouldn't say Flash. Uh, pastor, shouldn't say Flash. That's so rude. <laughs> flash. Is it, is this, no, that's in 2 Kings. You're going to 2 Kings 3? Yeah, chapter 8. Go ahead, read this. Can you read? Have you got it? Got, can you read? It, well, you're looking at me funny. Can, could you read it? Let, forget it. I'll quote it. Forget it. I'll quote it. Here's what happened. Here's what happened. The prophet told this widow woman, the Lord has called for a famine for seven years. And he said, I want you to leave Canaan and go to another place wherever you can find and dwell there because God's called for a famine for seven years. The Bible says she went to a a foreign land, and she lived there for seven years. Now, this is mind-boggling to me. At the end of the seven years, the Bible says, he was going to read it, but he can't. Said, he said, here's what happened. Said, she, here it is. She returned to talk to the king that she might get back her land and her house. She's on her way after seven years' loss. I don't care how long you've lost something. If that woman in one moment can get back seven years of loss, you can get back anything that you've lost in a moment of recovery if you'll go to the king and you'll talk to the king and you'll ask the king to give you back what you have lost. See, I'm almost done. The, the Bible says in, that she turned around and he's talking and Gehazi is talking to the king. And he's talking about how Elisha raised this young boy from the dead. And here comes this chick walking in and Elisha says, hey, I'm paraphrasing, that's the babe. 
that's the kid. That's, that's the kid he raised the dead. And the king said, is this so? He said, yes, he raised my son from the dead. And he turns, watch, in one moment, no debate, no probation, no anything. He turns around, restore everything that he's lost over the last seven years. If an earthly king would do that for his people, what do you think heaven's king would do for his people who ask in faith and expectation and want to recover what they've lost? I didn't give you the other scripture. I'll quote it. You go over to 2 Kings. I mean, uh, 2 Samuel. It's right after this episode. The Bible said, Saul is in battle with the Philistines. And it's going bad against him. Ready? And the scripture says, he's running for fear. He takes his sword and commits suicide. <laughs> said he stabbed himself and he fell down on the ground. If you read that story, it's only eight verses. Turns around, he turns and looks over his shoulder. He says, hey, who are you? And he said, I'm a young man, a Malachite. He, he said, come stand on me, for my life is yet in me, lest the Philistines come and abuse me or torture me. He said, kill me. So the Amalekite takes his spear and sword and stands on Saul and kills him. Takes the crown, takes his royal bracelets, and brings them to David. As if he's going to get a reward because he killed the king. And he turns around and he said, here's, here's what the Lord showed me. See, God's got to show this to me. I'm not smart. He's got to show this to me. He turns around and he says, how is it that you were not afraid to put your hand against the Lord's anointed? Please hear me, Pentecostals. Even when people have walked away from the truth, and leaders have acted like a stupid bunch of fools. Don't ever put your hand against them because the anointing is still on them. Even though they're in disobedience. Even, ah. David said, how dare you have killed the king? Here's what the Amalekites said. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, tell my spirit, tell my people, beware the spirit of the Amalekite. What's the spirit of the Amalekite? Here's what he said. For I was sure that he could not live after he was fallen. And it's like the Holy Ghost said, tell my people, the spirit of the Amalekite wants to make a decision about your future. I want to make a decision about your future. I say no matter how bad your wound is, how terrible your failure is, how messed up your fall is, you can recover from the worst mistake you've ever made. You can come back from a damage and an injury that you have made. Don't let somebody else tell you you can't recover. I, I, I'm almost done. I'm sorry I'm not preaching good. I, I really usually preach really good. In fact, sometimes I even buy my own tape. I'm just really, really good. Ready for this? Don't let an Amalekite determine whether you can come back. Secondly, sometimes when you're picking low cotton, don't listen to your own stupidity. In the book of Job and in the book of Jeremiah, two times it's recorded these words. My wound is incurable. That's a lie from the pits of hell. I don't care how terrible your mistake is. I don't care if you made the same one 40, 42 times. I don't care if everybody in UPC says you can't make it. Don't, don't you get it? A church is nothing but a hodgepodge of recovered people. I once was lost in sin. But Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. I was never in the yearbook as the man most likely to succeed. I was in the yearbook of the, as the man most likely to go to jail. 
I was a hell raiser. I was a thief. I had a dirty mind. I had a dirty mouth. I was a crook. I was stealing since I was 10 or 11 years old. I, I couldn't tell the truth standing on the Bible looking at Jesus. And here I am in the middle of my drunken affair, almost getting a, a divorce from Sister Arnold. And, and the Lord of Recovery comes into the room and says, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to fix you. I'm going to fill you. And I'm going to use you. I need some recovered people. I didn't say we have everything right. I just say we have experienced a recovery. Woo! Sister, I'm almost done. See, I, I was a terrible drunk. And, and when you go to AA, now that, that doesn't mean Apostolics Anonymous. And when you go to AA and you go, they ask you to testify Everybody that stands up and testifies, here's how they begin. Hi, my name is such and such, and I'm a recovering alcoholic. Well, here I am telling you right now in front of you, God, and everybody. My name is Jeff Arnold, and I'm a recovering drunk. I'm a recovering sinner. I'm a recovering jailbird. I'm a recovering liar. And I may fall down sometimes, but I'm in the process of recovery. That's what holiness is. It is the process of total recovery. Okay. Uh, I got I to gotta catch a plane. I got to catch a plane. I think I'm finished. Yeah, I think I'm finished. I just, uh, let me see, page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page. Okay. So, uh, just give me one more minute. Dave, we know the story. David, unfortunately, in a low time in his life, he, he uh, lusted after another man's wife, Bathsheba. He ended up taking her to bed, getting her pregnant, then turns around like a hypocrite and kills her husband with the sword of the Ammonites and then acts just like a Pentecostal. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Oh, I love the Lord. And, and for one year, he's playing a hypocrite. If you read Psalm, you do, you people read the Bible? When I say that sometimes, you look at me like, the what? <laughs> See, you have to turn off the internet for a minute and read the Bible. It's got a lot of great stories in it. Now, the Lord loves David so much, and David won't confess. If you read Psalms 32, verses 3 through 5, he said, All day long thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture dried up. My bones roared. What is he saying? He's under conviction. He's miserable. Food has lost its tape. The TV is not enjoyable. Videos are not happy. He's just miserable because God's got his hand on him. Listen to me. When conviction doesn't work, God's got one more trump card. He'll send a preacher right in your face. And he turned around and under conviction, couldn't get him to confess. Miserable, couldn't get him to confess. Feeling shame and guilt, couldn't get him to confess. Nathan, go, go talk to stupid. Go talk to stupid right now. And he tells him the story about the little ewe lamb and how that the guy took the poor little guy's lamb. And David's flipped out. Now, all of a sudden, he's righteous. I can't believe that moron would steal that poor guy's one little lamb. Uh, that guy needs to pay back fourfold. In fact, that guy needs to die. It's amazing how righteous you become when you're not guilty. And, and the prophet turned around and said, you're the guy. He said, I blessed you. I gave you Saul's house, Saul's wives. I gave you the kingdom. If you read your Bible once in a while, if you read your Bible, the Lord chews him out and says, I gave you this, and I gave you that, and I gave you this. Watch what he says. And if that had not been enough, if you would have asked me, I would have given you such and such. In other words, God is ready to bless. God is ready to recover. God is ready to restore. But you got to ask. And he turns around and he says, pray for me, preacher. I've sinned. If you read your Bible, the next verse says, and the prophet turned around and said, the Lord has just put away your iniquity. Now, that doesn't sound like 
reluctance. I, I don't mean to be rude. Am I on the internet? Am I all? Well, I'll say for all you folks that worship on the internet, thank God neither David nor the Lord were in UPC. You just take it to headquarters. Here's why. Had he been in UPC and God had been in UPC, he would not have recovered him he would have put him on probation. No, no, just. I'm going to put you on probation until I'm satisfied with your repentance. Who the blankety blank are you? If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin and all unrighteousness. We serve a God who is ready. You, you, you can stand up with me now. I, I, I think I've preached long enough. I, I, you understand? I'm not trying to be rude, UPC. I'm a part of UPC. I'm not going anywhere. But, but I have dealt with enough people who have unfortunately made bad decisions. I just dealt with a, a wonderful man who was a preacher, and his wife was gorgeous. She was a beautiful lady, had three beautiful children. He ended up getting himself in a, an affair, which was unfortunate. His wife divorced him. He lost his ministry. He lost his wife. He lost his kids. He came to hear me preaching at a conference. And he came all the way down and he said, I heard you preach about uh, refuge from despair. And I'm in despair. And I need you to talk to me, Brother Arnold, because I just want to be saved. I don't need the ministry. I don't need the pulpit. I lost my wife, my kids. I made a mess out of my life. So I go to church after church after church. This is what he told me. I'm, I'm not lying. He came right to me. I was preaching the camp meeting. We stayed in my cabin for a few hours, and I talked to him. And, and he said, every church I go to, the pastor makes me sit on the back row, and he tells all the people in the church, have nothing to do with him. Don't fellowship with him. Don't go eat with him. And I'm sitting there going, that's about as anti-Christ as you can get. And he says, all I want to do is worship and be saved, but, but I'm always being held hostage by the mistake I made. So I said to him, I said, son, when you repented, did the Lord forgive you? Oh, yes. I said, the issue's over. When David prayed that day at Ziglag, he said, shall I pursue? Will I overtake? He said, pursue, overtake, without fail, recover all. God didn't put him on probation until he was pleased. You see, when you're forgiven, you can be forgiven in five seconds. When you violate trust, trust takes a longer time with humans to get it back. But not with God. Not with God. When Peter lied and denied and ran away, the Lord, the Bible said the Lord met him in private and let him experience recovery because he is the Lord of recovery. Guess, you know why we love Simon Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost? We're listening to a recovered man. I, I, I wish I'd have preached better. I don't know how to preach any better. This what I'm trying to tell you, sweet, wonderful people, what a wonderful church you have here. Watch. God wants you to experience what he desires for you. Recovery. Amen. Now, if I'm not saying you're lost, what, can, can we, are we allowed to have an altar call? Okay, because all this, this COVID junk, you know, uh, people are crazy everywhere. So they're talking, ooh, mask, you know, fine. Six foot apart. What I'd like 
if I could, just for five minutes. Those of you that are honest enough to say somewhere in your life you have experienced some aspect of recovery. Maybe you're not totally recovered. Maybe you've got some other issues, but you've experienced some type of recovery. I'd like you to either start praising God where you're standing or come to the altar and just give God some thanks for the recovery that you've already experienced. Ha. Woo! We can't undo what we've done, but God can give us recovery. God can purge us. God can cleanse us. God can heal us. God can deliver us. Hallelujah. You've got a master that will not forsake you. Though you fall down, though you get sick, though you make terrible blunders, he will not turn his back on you. He wants you to experience recovery. To get back what you've lost. Your praise, your joy, your faith, your expectation. I don't know. I'm in the process of recovery. I think we are honest are going to be recovering until the rapture takes place. And as you walk in holiness, God's going to show you another air that you need more recovery in. But even though you haven't had anything through everything recovered, you're still His. He's still in love with you. He still cares about you. He doesn't want you lost. Would you, would you begin to pray for just a few minutes? You ready? To, you're going you're gonna to sing? You're going to sing? Come on. Come on, sing. I can't go over that. I go this Don't ever say your wound is incurable. Don't ever say that you can't be fixed. The devil is a liar. Don't ever let some Amalekite tell you your wound is too bad and you've fallen too many times and you can't get back up. Micah said, rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. 